Hey there everyone, it's AJ back with another video for your listening pleasure. This one has been much requested for the last two years and so, without further preamble, let's talk about Vecna. Vecna is the god of destructive and evil secrets, but his is a long and interesting story, because unlike many other gods, his origin was the mortal world. In the real world, Vecna grew to the status of god uh, simply because he is such an enigmatic figure in the written works. In the third supplement to the original Dungeons and Dragons rules, Eldritch Wizardry, Brian Bloom invented two ma magical artifacts he called the Hand and Eye of Vecna. These were supposedly the only remnants of an evil lich, Vecna, who had been destroyed long ago. The name Vecna was an anagram of Vance, the surname of Jack Vance, the fantasy author whose Fire and Forget magic system is used in Dungeons and Dragons. That was it, the humble origin in print, and all began from some quirky and macabre magical artifacts. Ten years later, the backstory of these artifacts was expanded a bit more, and finally in 1990, Vecna lives, or at least appeared, in an adventure as the main villain and now a demigod. But who is Vecna? Where did he come from? Originally he came from the world of Earth, uh, the Greyhawk setting. Vecna and his mother Mazel were born to, to the untouch, untouchable class cast in the Flan city of Fleeth. She trained him as a wizard in the arcane arts for many years before the city burned her as a witch. She taught him that the great serpent Moxuk taught the god kings of the Earthland their magic. This serpent is one of the ancient brethren, a group of powerful pre-deity beings that include the such ancient beings as Araman, Jazirian, and the Lady of Pain. Let me remind you here that the gods are pan-dimensional beings, as are the primordials, and not all of the dimensions follow the same historical narrative. The Lady of Pain is made up of many ladies of pain from many dimensions. Many dimensions. But I digress. Mazel taught the young Vecna that she, he was descended from these ancient brethren and that they devoured all those that honoured them in life. Later, when a princess of Fleeth requested a medicine from Mazel, she prescribed it, but the princess disregarded all instructions and poisoned herself with it, dying shortly thereafter. The city guard was ordered to kill the boy Vecna in front of his mother as a retaliation, but Mazel used her magic to allow Vecna to escape, dooming herself to execution. As his mother roasted to death in a public bonfire, screaming curses and vowing revenge, the young Vecna escaped, his heart burning with a deep and abiding hatred. Who knows how long he wandered in search and, uh, of deep, forbidden and forgotten places, but eventually he uncovered the ancient rites and made contact with the original world serpent. He then studied under the direct tutelage of Moxilk, said to be the personification of magic itself, whom his mother had served as a priestess and warlock, and personally I suspect part of the price of her pact was the life of her firstborn son. 1,000 years later, Vecna had risen to become the most powerful wizard in the land, and had already achieved lichdom, having carved an empire for himself in the Sheldemar Valley. During this time, he wrote the book called Ordinary Necromancy. He marched on Fleeth with an army of undead and spellcasters. He was nearly destroyed by the clerics, channeling the power of Fultus, the god of light which they blasted him with with a beam of light on his left side. He was saved by one of his generals, the half-fiend Aserak. Yes, the very same Aserak, bane of all adventurers, who built the Tomb of Horus and the Tomb of Annihilation. I'll be bringing you a video detailing the life, unlife and deeds of that arch-villain pretty soon. Victor's mortal life mostly considered, uh, uh, consisted of his quest for immortality. Though the tutelage of, uh, through the tutelage of Moxilk, the world serpent, uh, now, I feel it's important to talk about just what this means in the context of how Vecna has reached the level of power he has. Moxlick is a creature of incalculable and eternal power on a scale similar to the Lady of Pain and Ao, and was worshipped by the progenitor races. The World Serpent was the major deity. Uh, there was shared awareness of the power of Moxlick uh, through his worship. There were divine spells and so on granted by the World Serpent. Over time, these ancient empires fragmented into smaller kingdoms who brought unique aspects of worship with them, bringing the World Serpent and breaking him into smaller deities, forgetting the original World Serpent and depriving it of power to the point that it no longer grants spells or answers any prayers. But... Thousands of years later, many thousands of years later, it was the patron of Vecna's mother, and then claimed a devotion of Vecna himself, her firstborn child. Also of note is that an aspect, a fragment of Moxilic, is Mershulk, the greatest serpent deity of the Yuanti. 
So this is not a nice patron for Vecna to have. His humanity was stripped away from him long before he ever accepted the transition from living Archmage into Undead Lich. Uh, that his patron offered to him. And believe me, the people of the Sheldermare Valley, centred near the modern-day Rushmores, know full well the price of the transformation. Vecna was a dis, uh, was despotic in life, and in undeath he was tyrannical, and put entire villages to gruesome death just to fuel his magical experiments and rituals. He mastered the arts of necromancy, and many of the passages of the Book of Vile Darkness were penned by his hand. Vecna is a genius, a prodigy who has such mastery of mag magic he has managed to attain eternal existence through pacts with otherworldly powers that he then went about systematically destroying, taking, uh, taking all their power and remaining subservient or beholden to no one. As a super powerful undead archwizard, he attracted many followers and lieutenants, including many other powerful spellcasters, who inevitably embraced undead or undoubtedly met a horrible fate, and many powerful undead who flocked to his side swelled the ranks of his forces. Aseric was one, and also the vampire general came called Cass, who Vecna favoured and gifted a powerful artifact that he crafted by his own hand, a sword that became known as the Sword of Cass. So, over thousands of years after the execution of his mother, uh, Vecna arrived to visit, uh, over a thousand years, he arrived to visit his revenge on the city of Fleeth. Poor, poor Fleeth. Didn't see it coming. The city officials begged for mercies, one, one family in particular, offering their lives to save the population. Vecna accepted and ordered Cass to put them to gruesome death, while Vecna made preparations for his most powerful ritual yet, the rite of divine ascension. As Vecna rounded up and sacrificed thousands of people, Cass was also going on a murder spree, setting thousands of severed heads on spiked poles, gorging on rivers of blood. It was at this moment that Cass betrayed Vecna, right in the middle of his divine transformation. Cass lance, uh, lashed out and lopped off Vecna's left hand, which has remained infused with magical power ever since. And in the course of the resulting fight between him and Cass, Cass was utterly destroyed. Vecna also lost his left eye and his body was disintegrated. Aside from the fabled hand and eye, now artifacts of legendary power, Vecna was missing, presumably destroyed, and from then on for hundreds and hundreds of years. In truth, Vecna had achieved his revenge and was simply laying low and making other plans in another plane of existence. Meanwhile, in the mortal worlds, the remains of Vecna and his arcane legacy have something of a life of their own through the printed materials of the game. And, of course, Cass uh, went on and has rumours of his uh, return as well. He was survived on as a remnant of a, um, of a being in the Outer Plains. In the second edition adventure Die Vecna Die, it was stated that since Vecna was a lich first and a god second, many of his body parts were actually lost before Cass's betrayal. Since Vecna was a lich, he could lose a whole body and regenerate a new one near his phylactery, but the other parts of his old body would still be out there, resonating with the power of his undying will. In this regard, he was already well beyond any other form of lich that had been seen before, as his condition was completely self-sustaining. Die Die contains 12 other bits of his body as minor artifacts that 3rd edition collectively called the Fragments of Vecna. Additionally, issue 359 of Dragon Magazine features rules for the far, the left ear of Vecna as a minor artifact. And 4th edition's Open Grave sourcebook features a female Vecna worshipping lich called Osterneth, also known as the Bronze Lich, who still possesses the heart of Vecna, which she keeps in her chest. She's worthy of a video of her own right. Uh, to use any fragment, you have to have an empty space for it on your on or in your own body. Unless you were uh, already missing this bit, the removal process would inflict 2d6 points of damage for the smaller parts, such as a finger, tooth or ear. Removing an internal organ or an entire limb inflicts 10d10 damage, and instant death, of course, if it's a vital organ. This means that you need somebody else to install Vecna's heart, after which it will bring you back to life at one hit point. Cutting the artifacts free causes you to take the same level of damage as you will require magical healing or of the potent kind to restore the missing body part. I have mentioned that for years and years it has been hilarious uh, to have, I have to mention this, that it's been hilarious to have characters find the fabled head of Vecna. There is no head of Vecna, and the character chops their own head off in pursuit of power. Well, it's a hard lesson to learn in a very very memorable character death. and certainly hilarious for everybody else at the table who knows what's going on. 
All Vecna's fragments have a curse which requires characters to make a will saving throw once per month. In most games this would be when the DM remembers about the curse. Failure means that Vecna has an open line of communication with the character and has essentially charmed that character. This lasts for 44 plus 4 hours. The character will happily comply with their best buddy Vecna's requests and give over any secrets that, secrets that they have to this most trusted friend. Additionally, a fragment can be temporarily destroyed by any attack that inflicts at least 33 points of damage directly and specifically to it, except for the heart. But uh, but only being eaten by someone using the molar of Vecna can permanently destroy them. Otherwise, they just reform somewhere else, normally somewhere quite wicked and hard to get to. One hidden benefit of having a part of Vecna attached to your character is that it makes them immune to Vecna's magical powers. Anything that would not target himself will also not target that character. Of course, there are many ways that Vecna can kill that character, but at least it is something of an edge. Also, the character will be invisible to Vecna's scrying effects. Wounds inflicted by them will not be easily healed by Vecna, and he can't teleport away if restrained by that character. If someone bearing one of the fragments was to kill him, Vecna would be slammed back to Earth and lost uh, and lose a significant chunk of this divine power. So, what are these fragments? Okay, let's have a list of them. The Scalp of Vecna gives the host a white streak of hair as a physical indication of its presence. The host saves at plus two against harmful magic twice per day. Uh, can cause their hair to so twice to, per day they can cause the hair to animate, growing thirty feet longer and becoming a tendril that can grapple and restrain a single victim of medium or lower size. The first digit of Vecna replaces the character's right thumb with an overlarged digit sporting a blackened claw-like nail. The host saves against magic at plus two and can, four times per day, either cast Bless as a spell-like effect or cast Curse as a spell-like effect. This is performed with a simple gesture of either the thumb being up or the thumb being down. The second digit of Vecna replaces the character's right index finger with an overlarged digit sporting a blackened claw-like nail. They gain a plus two versus magic and can charm a single victim for one hour once per day by making a simple best ge beckoning gesture with the finger. You know, the come here gesture. The third digit of Vecna replaces the bearer's middle right, uh, middle Finger, right middle finger, with one sporting a massive dagger-like nail, making them slightly clumsier with that hand. The character has a plus one versus magic, and can slash or stab victims with a grotesque nail, as if it were a plus four dagger that secretes a necrotic poison. Constitution save versus poison will take uh, further 1d4 plus four damage. Additionally, the nail can be shot out like a hand crossbow uh, bolt. Plus four, and the same poison saving throw. This can be only done uh, once per day and removes the nail for the next 12 hours as it slowly grows back. The last digit of Vecna replaces the character's right pinky finger with one sporting a jagged fungus-eaten nail. It grants plus three versus magic and can be used to cast a duplicate of an already memorized spell once per four hours. Also, the character no longer requires somatic or gesture components when spellcasting, so that's a pretty good one for a spellcaster. The right eye of Vecna replaces the character's right eye with a hazed milky white orb that makes them look as if they're blind. It grants plus three versus magic and the ability to see in mundane or magical darkness out to 120 feet. Additionally, three times per day it can be used to inflict blindness on a single target who is looking at the character's eyes. This is uh, basically a personal darkness spell effect just for that victim. The molar of Vecna replaces one of the character's teeth, giving them a plus three versus magic and a plus four bonus to saves against poison. Additionally, three times per day, the power of the molar can augment the character's mouth. They can devour any non-magical material in bite-sized chunks, which can be used for, among other imaginative shenanigans, burrowing through the earth, stone or metal at a rate of one square foot per five rounds. Or the bearer can turn the more on living victims, gaining a plus four bite attack that inflicts 2d6 plus four damage. Each time it's activated, the molar's power remains active for 20 rounds. But it's one of the more sneaky artifacts, as there's no way to tell that this enchantment is active from outward appearances. The incisors of Vecna are two teeth that replace the character's upper canines with black vampire-like fangs. In addition to giving a plus two versus magic, the character may transform into a vampire version of themselves for an eight-hour stretch twice per month. 
They cannot create spawn vampires using their blood drain in this form, and drinking somebody of good or neutral alignment to death will rack a good bear, uh, good character with guilt, causing them to suffer a level of exhaustion for the following week. Continuing to do this will force a personality change and a shift them to an evil alignment. This is a magical effect. The character can attempt to avoid these consequences by having magic, um, the magic dispelled or using remove curse each time they do it. The foot of Vecna replaces the character's left foot without a visible trace but causing a strange hitch in their step as they lurch about. The, it grants plus one versus magic and a plus three bonus to attack rolls and damage rolls with those making kick attacks. Additionally, it has an array of spell-like abilities that the bearer can trigger, although only four such spells can be cast per day. They are cast as a 20th level caster. They are Jump, Spider Climb, Freedom of Movement, Water Walk, Feather Fall, and Levitation. The left ear of Vecna replaces the character's left ear, grants advantage on all checks to listen for sounds, and provides a plus four on saves against thunder damage. Three times per day, the host can cast the spell Blindness Deafness, with um, only deafness being available, or Clairvoyance, um, and only hearing version of Clairvoyance being available. The character can understand all spoken languages, and once per day can cast Thunder Wave as a tremendous shout. The skin of Vecna replaces a quite a large swath of skin uh, on the character, covering the left side of their face, their neck, and the torso with dark scabrous skin that causes them to lower their charisma score by 5 points. It grants plus 4 versus magic, and the permanent effects of resist fire and resist cold. Additionally, it has an array of spell-like abilities that the host can trigger, although only 4 such spells can be cast per day. Those are Mirror Image, Polymorph Self, stone skin and protection from energy. Using its polymorph self does not cause the trademark disfiguration to go away. Finally, the heart of Vecna replaces the host's heart, obviously leaving a nasty scar in the process. It grants a plus one versus magic and all the bonuses of a ring of regeneration. Additionally, once per month the character can inflict a heart attack by making an unarmed strike to a victim's chest. The target must succeed on a death saving throw or die instantly. That's a death saving throw, that's an unmodified roll, and it only gets one chance. I should mention that the save difficulty class for all of these spells, is, like spell-like effects, is 20. The range and duration and damage of any spell effects is determined as if it's cast by a level 20 spellcaster. And yes, all of those spell saving throw bonuses are cumulative. So those things are damned powerful and hotly sought after by those who know they even exist. Talking of those in the know, let's have a chat about the cult of Vecna, the Vecnates. There is an awesome article in Dragon 348 of October 2006 written by Sean K. Reynolds and Samuel D. Weiss, beautifully illustrated by Andrew Hua, with a nice temple map by Christopher West. Um, I'll cover some of the basics about this cult and its activities. Vecnates are very interesting for a religion that venerates a being who seeks to kill off all other deities, usurp all of their powers, and rule the multiverse with absolute tyranny. This sort of nihilistic death cult normally attracts reckless and deranged individuals. Not so the Vecnates. They maintain order by mutually assured destruction. One of the primary mandates and chief activities of the cult is to collect secrets. They seek out the dirt on everyone, particularly each other. And each member of the cult will have others who know something about them that they do not want to become public knowledge. So, they have the power over each other. What's more, thanks to the spell Speak With Dead, merely killing off such threats is not enough to protect from this sort of extortion. So they end up protecting each other's lives and being a lot more cautious and secretive than most other death cults. Thanks to the planner powers of Vecna being quite willing to share the secrets of creating undead and the transformation ritual into lichdom, the cult attracts a lot of evil spellcasters. Getting involved with a Vecna cult can be almost unavoidable at times. They tend to make themselves at home hiding in plain sight. For example, they may very well have been the influence behind a revitalization of a rundown temple to any particular god in town, it doesn't matter which one. They are merely paying lip service to that faith as a form of cover for their real activities. No matter what faith it is, they will probably introduce the practice of telling your misdeeds and lies in private to one of the priests, so that the gods can give you uh, equally private instructions for atonement and a path back to their blessings. So this is basically confession. This, of course, is all a lie. 
The cult of Vecna is simply gathering leverage against everyone in town, because if they're not, if you're not telling secrets about yourself, chances are that someone else is telling them the secrets about you. When the Vecnates have something really juicy, they go to work on you, probably not revealing exactly what they know, just that they know enough to ruin you. The skilled and charismatic Vecnate cultists not only learn your name, uh, Need sorry, the skilled and charismatic Vecnate cultists need only learn your name to bluff their way into think, making you think that they've found out something you really don't want anyone else to know. Any dealings with this cult will wind up like that eventually. You might find yourself a potential ally who has all sorts of information to help you on your adventures, but the moment they know enough to have something over you, their true nature starts to show, and pretty soon it is you working for them. And the more you do, the deeper their hold becomes over you. A good number of these cultists never really wanted to be a member of this cult in the first place, but they have little choice but to become involved, and the deeper they go, the worse it gets. As befits a god of secrets, the Vecnate cult is very hard to uncover. They will have corrupted what passes for law and order very quickly, following, uh, followed by those who have the most power and influence in the city or town. So a character who tries to expose the cult may quickly end up framed for some gruesome crimes and headed for the executioner's block, or languishing in prison, or worse, simply handed over to the cult for eventual sacrifice and probably conversion into some form of mindless undead. Creating undead is a specialty of this cult. They know more about it than just about anyone else, and have the powerful ability to create a lesser lich. This is a boon granted to loyal members of the cult who are not spellcasters. They are killed in a special ritual, their soul tied to a lesser phylactery, and they have many of the basic qualities of lich without the spell power and such potent control over entropy. This is quite a lure to powerful merchants and such, who lust after money and power over everything else. They don't see being turned into a lich as much of a downside for centuries more of their greedy existence. The cult has a few ceremonies and sayings of note. They generally don't like their members doing anything too flashy and obvious, such as cutting off their left hand and gouging out an eye. That's more of a monstrous cult sort of thing. However, they may walk around wearing a black glove on their left hand or an eye patch over their left eye. They may wear the holy symbol of Vecna, and, or unholy symbol I should say, and an open hand with an eye on the palm. They frequently say things like, secrets never die. And at the start of these ceremonies, you will always hear them chant the following. Vecna guide us. We whisper your name. We seek the knowledge. We find the secrets for power, for earth, for your will, for your rule. In the name of the hand and the eye, we open our minds to you. Evil cults on Faerun still mention the name of the world of Greyhawk, interestingly enough. There are no direct... Uh, dedicated holy text of Vecna. This cult simply doesn't keep written records. However, they hold the Book of Vile Darkness in very high esteem. And the Book of Keeping, uh, although not actually written by Vecna, the Book of Keeping, a book of Ugoloth summoning, is heavily linked to the cult of Vecna, as the cultists have the only known copies that are free of the intentional errors introduced into the book by the fiends who wrote the volume as a trap for would-be summoners. The cult has one of these books, uh, a cult that has one of these books and a ready supply of plenty of wealth, which they gain through good old fashioned extortion, can summon and hire the Yugoloths. And this is a very dangerous supernational uh, mercenary force to have. Relics of the cult include the Sword of Cass, the Rod of the Whispered One, which is an artifact that Vecna created for use of his commanders when he was away on business. It can be used as a potent scrying tool and also a powerful scepter of command that is recharged by sacrificing living victims. There's also the Tome of Secrets. These books are filled with pages dedicated to describing monsters and beasts. A person who slices open their hand and puts it on the page will lose one constitution point for six days, and during that time they gain a plus four on all knowledge, uh, attack rolls, skill checks, and saving throws concerning the creature on that page. Healing the con damage will end the bonus, and it is possible to drain all constitution and be killed as a result, in which case the soul goes to Vecna and the body gets up and walks around as a mindless zombie. Powerful cults of Vecna work towards a ritual called the Making, where they craft two special undead flesh golems. One has two large swords and its head is replaced by a huge hand. The body is made of hundreds of hands gruesomely stitched together while the victims were still alive. This construct, called the Hand, is cut free from them when the ritual completes. In another ritual, victims are mutated and warped by dark magic, then a thin, tall, nightmare construct is created from their eyes. 
with its head being one great eye. And as you guessed it, its name is the eye. The hand can drain strength from victims with its grasping, crushing hand head, and the eye can drain life from its victims with a potent gaze attack. Otherwise, they're very similar to flesh golems. Um, and of course, making these things is a huge kadoo to that particular cult. Um, it's it's one of their ways of graduating as a as a proper cult of Vecna. Anyway, Vecna did not stray, stay gone forever and rose as a demigod of magic and secrets in the world of Greyhawk. In 581 CY or 1361 Dale Reckoning, his cult helped set events in motion that would have granted him the power of a greater god, but the plan was ultimately foiled and Vecna ended up imprisoned in the demi plane of dread, the location commonly known as Ravenloft. But with much, diffic uh, much difficulty and a whole volume of outright lies, he managed to broker a deal with Ayus, who not only freed Be Vecna, but unwillingly merged with Vecna, who absorbed his p power and broke free of Ravenloft by accessing a doorway into Sigil. Obviously, this was unheard of. I mean, but he was a demigod who was stepped foot into the cage, the City of Doors. And Vecna managed to use the central hub of the multiverse to come perilously close to rearranging all existence to his whims. Vecna's multiverse-shattering campaign in Sigil is used as an in-universe way of explaining the differences between 2nd edition and 3rd edition Dungeons & Dragons, though there was a lot of confusion all around. When Vecna was ejected from Sigil by a party of adventurers, Ayuz was freed and Vecna returned to Earth, greatly reduced in power, though still a lesser god. But Vecna had learned much, and at some point he finally managed to get the undivided attention of Ao, and is now, at least in the Forgotten Realms, a greater god. Oh, to be a fly on the wall for that conversation. So, that's the lore of Vecna and kicks off a renewed focus on the undead here on the TMG channel, so be prepared for a lot of undead ecologies for a while. Also, now that you know about the head of Jet Vecna joke, you have officially made it into the D&D nerd clubhouse. Thank you for listening. Please give this video the blessing thumb of Vecna. If you would like to access the script, head over to the Patreon and subscribe for a minimum of $1 a month. You have full control over what you wish to donate there. Also, that's that's much appreciated. You can also donate to my PayPal if you would prefer. Details below. My humble thanks to all who do so. Also, big thank you to all of the folks who joined me for my weekend live stream. It was great to hang out with you guys and talk about D&D. Until the next video, take care, be fair, happy gaming everyone.